السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن وله أما بعد uh, Yesterday I spoke about the importance of Muslim unity and I mentioned the ayat and the ahadith the verses of the Quran and the sayings of a Prophet where he commanded us to be unified together and I mentioned the blessings of the necessity of the importance of Muslims all coming together now, I know that not all of you attended that talk yesterday. Uh, and unfortunately, I'm going to have to move on from where I left off over there. So for those who did not attend that talk, from what I understand, they will put that talk online. So you can listen to that talk, inshaAllah ta'ala. Today's talk is a little bit more, is it even possible to be more controversial than yesterday because of the Q&A? A little bit more controversial. It's a little bit more academic. Because a question was asked, actually a number of questions were asked yesterday that hinted at the, one of the biggest problems of unity. And that is the problems of divisions that are very real within the ummah. How can you have unity? Uh, the question was asked. How can you have unity when people have different interpretations of Islam? When somebody is doing the mawlud, another is not doing it. Somebody is doing the ta'zim, another is not doing it. Somebody is believing X, another is believing Y. On what basis are you going to have unity? So in today's short talk, and I want to leave some time for Q&A, I want to shed light on a hadith that really gets to the crux of the matter. And this is the famous hadith known as the hadith of the iftiraq, or the splitting up of the ummah. It is literally called the hadith of the splitting up of the ummah. Hadith al-iftiraq. The hadith of the splitting up of the ummah. And this hadith is a famous hadith. This is a mashhur hadith narrated in the four Sunan books. Sunan Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi, Nisa'i ibn Majah, in the Muslim Imam Ahmad, in many other narrations of hadith. And the gist of it, I'm not going to go into the details of each narration and who said what. The gist of it is something you have all heard. And that is, the Prophet ﷺ said, that the Yahud, the Jews, split up into 71 groups. And the Christians split up into 72 groups. And my Ummah shall split up into 73 groups. My Ummah shall split up into 73 groups. In another version of the hadith, the Prophet wasallam said that all of them are destined for the fire except for one. And he was asked, which one is this? And in a Tirmidhi, the response is Al Jama'ah, the group of Muslims. In a uh, hadith in Abu Dawud, he said that whatever I am following today and my Sahaba are following, that is the saved group. And these hadith are well known, and the bulk of the muhaddithun, the bulk of the scholars of hadith, have accepted them to be authentic. And our theologians, our scholars have dealt with these hadith as being an integral part of Islam. We believe that the Prophet ﷺ said this. Now, the question arises here, our Prophet ﷺ is predicting disunity. He's quite frankly telling us, my ummah will be divided into 70 groups. And here I am preaching unity. What is to be done? Well, firstly, realize I'm not the one preaching unity. What did I quote you yesterday? Allah and His Messenger. The, the very person who predicted the disunity is commanding you to be unified. Isn't that the case? Allah says in the Quran, وَاعْتَصِمُوا بِحَبْلِ اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا So realize the Sharia has no contradiction. The same one who told you that a reality will happen and that reality is that this ummah will be divided is the same one who told you that you should be united. So what do we do with these ahadith of the 73 groups? Firstly realize my dear brothers and sisters before we even begin talking about the explanation of this hadith that this hadith is in fact a miracle that demonstrates the truth of our Prophet ﷺ. How so? Imam al-Bayhaqi, a famous scholar of hadith, wrote a book that is now printed in 13 volumes. It is called Dala'il al-Nubuwa. 
the proofs of the prophecy of our Prophet ﷺ. How do we know he's a Nabi? And he puts this hadith in that book as well. One of the evidences that our Prophet ﷺ is a prophet is the hadith of the 73 groups. Why? Because at a time and place when the ummah was one, when nobody could imagine difference, when nobody could imagine that the ummah would be fractured up, our Prophet ﷺ predicted it. And he informed it, and it has become a reality. And this clearly demonstrates that this hadith is a mu'jizah, a miracle of our Prophet ﷺ. Now, the hadith has proved to be problematic for many reasons, but it should not be problematic. It should not be problematic. And the problem comes in people misunderstanding the hadith, not from the hadith. The problem comes in people misusing and abusing the hadith. And the hadith obviously cannot be problematic in and of itself. And we need to clarify and shed light on what does this hadith mean? What is the gist? What is the intent of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam? Well, a number of points here. Some of you have paper and pen, you should take notes. This is going to be a little bit of an academic talk. One of the points I want to mention. Notice our Prophet is not commanding to be fractured up. He's predicting the fracturing up. And there's a difference between the two. The command is to be unified. The command is to stick together. The prediction is that unfortunately not everybody will do that. So we have to realize this hadith is not a license to differentiate ourselves. It's not a license to open up a different firqa, a different masjid, a different group, just because of the hadith. Didn't the Prophet ﷺ predict it? Our Prophet ﷺ predicted a lot of things. He predicted immorality, he predicted fahisha, he predicted the spread of music and the spread of nudity, he predicted increase in murder. He did not approving of any of this. It's not a stamp of approval, it's a prediction of the end of times. And the predictions of the end of times are meant to be fought against, by and large. They're meant to be fought against. So this is not a license to differentiate. It's not a license to break up. It's simply a prediction that a time will come when unfortunately much of the ummah will be divided up. As for the commands of the Quran and Sunnah, all of them stress the importance of unity. What did the Prophet ﷺ say? We quoted that, that hadith yesterday. The believer to the other believer is like the bricks in the wall. Each brick strengthens the other brick. What did our Prophet ﷺ say? When one member of the ummah is in pain, the whole ummah must be in pain. These are the commands. Do not conflate the commands with the predictions. What you need to do is the commands. The predictions will happen. You need to delay and postpone them as much as possible. Also realize, that our Prophet ﷺ used the word iftiraq. And iftiraq is a very profound word. Iftiraq means a cleaving away, a breaking, a cut. This is not just a difference of opinion. He didn't say ikhtilaf. He said iftiraq. And the difference between the two is the difference between the heavens and the earth. The ummah has always had ikhtilaf. The Sahaba, the companions of our Prophet ﷺ, they disagreed amongst one another about issues of fiqh, about even compiling the Qur'an. Abu Bakr, wanted, Abu Bakr was hesitant to compile the Qur'an, and Umar insisted, insisted, insisted. The Sahaba disagreed amongst themselves over many things. Their disagreements did not lead to iftiraq. And we need to be very clear about this. It is okay it is permissible, it is what the ummah has done to disagree about the finer details of Islamic law, to disagree about the finer interpretations of the Sharia. We have a historical legacy of disagreement. What are the madhahib except a legacy of disagreement with respect? Imam Shafi'i said the famous quote that, I believe my opinion to be right, but I acknowledge the possibility that I could be wrong and my opponent is right. And I believe my opponent's position, the other madhab, might be wrong. But I acknowledge the possibility that it is right. This is Imam al-Shafi'i speaking. How about me and you? They accept the possibility of ikhtilaf, and they do not cause ikhtilaf to lead to iftiraq. I hope you understand this Arabic here. Let me tra translate the Arabic here. They allowed the possibility of difference of opinion. And they did not 
allow the difference of opinion to lead to division in the ummah. And that was the gist of my responses yesterday. That we need to agree to disagree about the finer points of Islamic law. It's not something we need to split masajid over. The, 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 the traditional madahib, our historical legacy that the ummah has accepted. Allah has written qabul for these positions. And if somebody is praying with the hand here or there or saying ameen out loud or taraweeh is 8 or 20 or whatever other positions might be found. Subhanallah, our sahaba, it is authentically narrated. We have dozens of different fatawa and fiqh positions within the era of the sahaba. And they loved one another, they prayed behind one another. They didn't boycott one another. They didn't build a different masjid just because one sahabi had a different fiqh position. They understood that not every difference of opinion should lead to a difference of the heart. And this is the key point that before we move on, that the wording of our Prophet ﷺ is not ikhtilaf. It is what? I want everybody to tell, tell me, what is it? Iftiraq. And iftiraq means you break away and cut off. And you, you can disagree without breaking away and cutting off. You can have ikhtilaf without Iftiraq. Memorize this phrase. You can have ikhtilaf without iftiraq, and the Sahaba are the best example of this. Also from this hadith, another point we learn is that the general ruling, the asl we call it in Arabic, the basic in English we can say the status quo, is that the ummah shall be one and cohesive, and small groups will break away. Iftiraq must occur from a large whole. Iftirah must occur from a massive amount, and then you have small groups breaking away. So it's not as if the entire bulk of the ummah will disintegrate. No. It is rather that there will be splinter groups, but the bulk of the ummah will remain. And we'll get to this point after a while. Another point of benefit here. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned that my ummah will split into 73 groups. Now, Many of the scholars understood this hadith to be verbatim, literal 73. And they would write books. We have books from the 4th century of the Hijrah, the 5th century of the Hijrah, the 6th century of the Hijrah, listing the, the, the groups. The first group is this, the second group is this, the third group is this, all 73. But there was one problem. Every time somebody wrote a book, the next few years another group was formed. And this is historically true. Every time a scholar wrote a book, and the experts here, and mashallah, there are a number of mashayikh and, and elders here, and I'm embarrassed to be speaking in front of these elders. Wallahi, Allah knows, but Allahul Musta'an. But our elders here and, and, and the mashayikh here know that there were books written in the 4th, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th centuries. And they kept on listing the 73 groups. But the problem is every time they finished one book, within a few years, another theology appeared, another group appeared. And therefore, this led to another opinion, which is insha'Allah, it seems to be the stronger opinion. And that is that the number 7 and 70 and 700 is an Arabic expression. Not meant to be understood literally 73. And the evidence for this are numerous beyond the scope of this class. And once again, the elders who have studied Arabic and Balagha know what I'm talking about here. But this is a type of kinaya or a type of uh, allusion. Allah says in the Quran in Surah At-Tawbah, "In تَسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمْ سَبْعِينَ مَرَّةً لَنْ يَغْفِرَ اللَّهُ لَهُمْ Allah speaking about the hypocrites. And He tells our Prophet ﷺ, even if you were to ask 70 times that they be forgiven, Allah will not forgive them. This is about the munafiqeen. Now, does this mean if He were to ask 71, Allah will forgive? It's an expression. 70 times, 700, I visited you 70 times. And the Arabs would say, Zurtuka sab'ina marra. It's an expression. And it means a quantity round about 70. So we don't have to be so literal that we list one group, two group, three group. And this is actually perhaps a mistake that some of the scholars made and other scholars disagreed with this. And they said, no, it's not literally 73. It is a generic 73. And the point of the hadith is that our ummah will have more groups than the other ummahs. Our ummah will have more groups than the other ummahs. Now, why does our ummah have more groups than the other ummahs? Well, a person can say this is something that denigrates our ummah compared to the other ummahs. They were luckier than us. And isn't our ummah the best of all ummahs? And we respond, in fact, the fact that we have more groups 
is a blessing for our ummah because it demonstrates many things. First and foremost, it demonstrates that our ummah will have the longest life frame, the longest time frame, the longest period of existence. All the other ummahs live for shorter periods of time and they still disagreed in 71, 72 groups. And wallahi, look at how long uh, you know, Judaism flourished in the early ages, then Christianity came. How long Christianity flourished and now it is on the decline. And Islam is the one that is lasting and spreading. And the people are still believing in it. And the converts are still coming in. Secondly, it is a blessing that we are the most multicultural of all of Allah's ummahs ever. Ever. No ummah has ever been as multicultural, multi-ethnic as us. Obviously, because Allah sent, وَإِلَىٰ عَادٍ أَخَاهُمْ وَإِلَىٰ ثَمُودَ أَخَاهُمْ وَإِلَىٰ Every single prophet went to one nation. So what did you expect except that one nation to believe in him? We are the only ummah. Our Prophet was sent, رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ إِلَىٰ الْعَرَبِ وَالْعَجَمِ To the Arab and the non-Arab, to the white and the black and everybody in between. And all you need to do is to look at any conference, any conference of a religion. And you go to any church, any synagogue, any other temple, and then you go to the masjid, and you see the cultural diversity. The fact that despite this diversity, we, we only have one extra, this is a miracle and a blessing for us. And also the most important point, we are the only ummah that will have one correct and, and, right, and rightly guided sect of the 73. And the others did not have this rightly guided sect. The others, none of them were rightly guided. And that's why Allah had to send another Prophet. We are the only ummah we shall have, as our Prophet ﷺ said, the hadith is in, this hadith is in Bukhari, that there will always be a group of my ummah clearly manifest upon the truth. There will always be a group of my ummah clearly manifest upon the truth until the judgment of Allah comes or the verdict of Allah comes meaning the Day of Judgment. So this group of Ummah, this saved group or the right group, shall be in existence until the Day of Judgment. And no other previous Ummah had this blessing. So in fact, for us to have 73 groups and the other monocultural, one culture, small time periods, to have 72 and 71, this is a blessing for us. Knowing that we are the one that has the rightly guided group as well. Another point of benefit that we're deriving from this hadith is that our Prophet ﷺ said that uh, all of them will be in the fire of hell except for one and this leads to actually a big problem that some people have with this hadith and it has caused some of the modernists to reject hadith to reject hadith and we are not of those people, I am not of those people. If the hadith is authentic, then we accept it as coming from our Prophet ﷺ. But this hadith has been rejected by many people who believe that it's problematic for this reason. What is the reason? They say, 72 out of 73 is a big fraction. And the hadith is saying that the bulk of the ummah, therefore, are misguided. And the bulk of the ummah will go to hell. You see the problem? Do you understand the problem? The claim is being made. I am not saying this, don't misquote me. If you're sleeping, wake up. The claim is being made by some misinformed people that this hadith tells us that the bulk of the ummah is misguided. And the bulk of the ummah is going to Jahannam. After all, 72 out of 73 is a large fraction. Is that not the case? Right? Now subhanallah, this is a big misunderstanding. And all you need to do to correct it is simple math and history. Simple math and history. 72 out of 73 is a large fraction only if each of the units is exactly the same. If one group has 50 people, another group has 1000 people, another group has 70 people, and mashallah tabarakallah, the largest has hundreds of thousands, millions then who cares about all of the 72 put together? And this is the reality of our ummah. You look at the groups that have deviated, genuine people of strange ideologies. The first split to ever occur in the ummah, this is a historical fact, was that of a group called the Kharijites. 
the rebels. And they had some bizarre beliefs. They had some beliefs that the sinner becomes a non-Muslim. If you lie, you cheat, you steal, automatically you become a kafir. This is their theology. If you do something wrong, you drink alcohol, this makes you a kafir. This is an extremist group and they have some bizarre tendencies and whatnot. Now, they are still around to this day, believe it or not. They are still around to this day. But if you gather all of them up and you look at their quantity, they are less than 0.5% of the whole ummah. Less than 0.5% of the whole ummah. The bulk of the groups that appeared withered away and no longer exist in our times. There was a group called the Jahmiyyah. There was a group called the Jahmiyyah. And if you read any book of theology, if you even read Sahih al-Bukhari, and we have, mashallah, the Shaykh al-Hadith of Sahih al-Bukhari here at Trinidad, sitting amongst us, mashallah, tabarakallah. What did Imam al-Bukhari call his last book? Kitab al-Tawheed wa rad ala al-Jahmiyyah. The book of Tawheed and refuting the Jahmiyyah. Who are these Jahmiyyah? They no longer exist. They no longer exist. Yet our classical scholars, they wrote many books against them. The ignorant person would assume this Jahmiyyah must be every second person amongst me. He must be hiding behind my door. He must be this. The reality is they were, as with all such groups, barking loudly but having no bites. They have presence with the tongue, but not with actual followers. And again, just for your information, going into a, a tangent here, uh, that Alhamdulillah, my master's dissertation from Medina was about the founder of the Jahmiyyah, Jahm ibn Safwan, and his theological views. And I wrote, Alhamdulillah, 800 page dissertation available in Arabic, two volumes, about the theology of Jahm ibn Safwan and his effects on the Ummah. Now, this research that I did, I discovered that the Jahmiyyah never numbered more than 50 people. 50 people. Yet because their beliefs were so bizarre and they were spreading it, trying to spread it so much, our scholars wrote many books against them. But the fact of the matter is they were so small. Another classical group called the Mu'tazila, another famous group of the past, they became so powerful even the Khalifa became a part of their group. And he began persecuting Muslims, he persecuted Imam Ahmad for believing in Sunni theology. He almost killed Imam Ahmad because of this. But where are the Mu'tazil now? They're all gone. So 72 out of 73, when most of these 72 might not even exist anymore. When the ones that do exist are always and have always been a minority. They're not the majority. So therefore, the bulk of the Ummah is rightly guided and shall always remain rightly guided. And this is not something I am saying. This is something that is mutawatir. It is reported in numerous traditions of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He was the one who told us to the Sahaba. He said to the Sahaba, wouldn't you love it that if you one ummah, and, there, and by the way, there have been over 100,000 prophets as we know, so 100,000 ummahs, right? He told the Sahaba, would you not love it that if you were one third of the whole people of Jannah, the Sahaba said, Allahu Akbar, one ummah competing with 99,000 other ummahs and we are one third, Allahu Akbar. Then he paused, then he said, what about if I told you, you are half of the people of Jannah? Allahu Akbar. Then he said, Wallahi inni la arju, I hope that you shall be two thirds of the people of Jannah. What does this show? The bulk of the ummah, alhamdulillah, are people of righteousness and taqwa. Our Prophet ﷺ, in another hadith, he said, I saw the prophets one after the other, and their ummahs were raised in front of me, and a prophet had five people, a prophet had ten people, a prophet had one person, and I even saw a prophet with nobody behind him. He didn't have a single convert, he didn't have an ummah. Then I saw a massive amount raised up. And I hoped it was my ummah. But it was said to me, no, this is the ummah of Musa alayhi salam. Then it was raised to me another amount that blocked the horizons. And that was told to me, this is your ummah. So my dear brothers and sisters, don't take one hadith and derive 72 out of 73 and then say, khalas, everybody's going to Jahannam. No, look at the other hadith as well. Look at it in the context of the very person who told you. 
That 72 out of 73 are misguided. Look at it in the context of history, Islamic history. The bulk of these sectarian differences no longer exist. Where are the Jahmiyyah? Where are the Mu'tazila? The Khadijites are barely found in only one country in Oman. Uh, in Oman, I just care, I shouldn't have said that, but I just said it. In, in Oman, there are some Khadijites still. This is the reality. The government of Oman and the Grand Mufti is still following this type of theology. They have, but small minority. Not every Omani, by the way. The, the, the bulk of the Omani citizens are uh, uh, Sunni Muslims, but the, the, the minority that is in charge is of this group. But the point being, how, what percentage of the Ummah? And even Wallahi, 0.5%, this is a bit high, maybe even 0.3%, something of this nature, something very trivial like this. So, the point being that to claim that the bulk of the Ummah is misguided and going to Jahannam is a huge, it's a grossly inaccurate statement. It ignores the reality of our religion. It ignores what our Prophet ﷺ himself said in so many other hadith. Yet another point of benefit is that our Prophet ﷺ is saying that my ummah shall divide into 73 groups. My ummah shall divide into 73 groups. Now, this one phrase is perhaps the most important phrase that I want to leave you with. Uh, in, in this entire lecture. He said, My Ummah. I want those words to sink in. Ummati. Our Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is saying that every one of these 73, I have a relationship with him, even if there's some disagreements. But he is from my, he's Ummati. Anybody who comes and says, this man is not from Ummati Muhammad, he's a kafir. You have disobeyed your own Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Do you understand this point here? Our Rasul sallallahu is saying, my Ummah. Which means he's not talking about the groups that have left the fold of Islam. Those groups are not a part of the 73. There are groups that believe in bizarre beliefs. In America, maybe you've not heard of them, they're called the Nation of Islam. Elijah Muhammad preached back in the 1930s. He said that, astaghfirullah, this is what he believes, that Allah came in the form of a man to earth. And he preached some bizarre theology and whatnot. We don't consider the nation of Islam to be on the 73 list. They're outside the fold of Islam. That they don't make it to the list even. There are groups that believe in a prophet after our prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And we do not have any difference of opinion that anybody who believes in a Nabi, in a Rasul, after Khatamun Nabiyyin, after Imam al Mursaleen, then khalas, end of story, you are not a Muslim. I don't care what you call yourself. You are not on the 73 list. So, those who have different theologies that might be incorrect. But those theologies don't expel them from the fold of Islam. They are within the 73, and therefore each and every one of them is a Muslim. So all of the ahadith I quoted yesterday, and I hope that those of you who were not here yesterday, please listen to that lecture. Because it's very important, this is actually a part two of that lecture. All of the ahadith I quoted yesterday about Kindness to Muslims, mercy to Muslims, salam to Muslims, visiting the Muslim sick, following the grave of the Muslim, praying over the Muslim. They apply to every single one of the 73. Because they are of the ummah of our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, inna ummati. He is ascribing a relationship between these people and himself. Who are we to deny that relationship? Yes, there are some bizarre beliefs. Yes, that's true. Some people have strange ideologies. But, and this is a question we we'll answer at the end, as long as that ideology doesn't reach the level of blasphemy, of kufr, we will say these groups are within the fold of Islam. And by and large, my dear brothers and sisters, the bulk of the ummah has alhamdulillah followed the general ideology of Islam. And we'll get to this point uh, in a while. Another uh, point as well that we need to mention over here, is that no doubt the other 72 groups, 
the, the, the Prophet says 72 are misguided, 72 are going to Jahannam. No doubt they are all Muslims as we said, but they have done something that causes some type of breaking away. Now, what have they done that causes them to break away? And this is a question that obviously is a very important one. Yet it is also the one that requires the most amount of knowledge. And so it is very difficult to answer this question so easily. It requires the most amount of knowledge that what is the ikhtilaf? What is the iftiraq? What is the uh, level of difference that is reached before a group actually becomes a member of the different group? But by and large, our scholars have said that a fundamental difference of theology is what breaks away from the unity of the Muslims. Not differences in legal opinions. Differences in legal opinions, by and large, have been tolerated by the Sahaba and Tabi'un. And as a general rule of thumb, I want all of you to memorize a simple rule. That Alhamdulillah, our Ummah has had a number of madhahib, madhabs, in Sunni law. And we have historically accepted these madhabs as being legitimate interpretations, legitimate attempts to follow Islam. Any differences found within these madhabs should never cause iftiraq. Any differences found within these madhabs should never cause iftiraq. The legal differences of opinion should never cause differences of the heart. Take this as a general rule of thumb. And we have so many narrations from Imam Abu Hanifa himself, from Imam Shafi'i, from Imam Malik, from Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, about how they respected the other scholars, even if they disagreed with them. And unfortunately, it is the ignorant people, it is not the true scholars, it is the ignorant people who say, oh, you say Amin out loud, I'm not gonna pray behind you. You pray with your hands here, I'm not gonna pray behind you. You do this, I'm not gonna pray behind you. Subhanallah. One of the most famous students of Imam Abu Hanifa, and his name was Muhammad al-Shaybani, went to study with Imam Malik, rahimahullah ta'ala. And he became one of the most famous students of Imam Malik. And he told his students, I benefited from the both of them, from Imam Malik and from Imam Abu Hanifa. And this is the attitude of the early scholars. Unfortunately, it is our scholars, or sometimes our ignorant people, not scholars, who don't understand differences of legal opinions do not and should not break differences of heart. So what does break the ikhtilaf? Where does the iftirah come? For example, if somebody denies qadr, he says, I don't believe in qadr. This is a huge issue. It's not a trivial issue. And scholars will decide is this a denial that leads to deviation or it leads to heresy and blasphemy? And by and large, this is an advanced issue, but by and large, to say that we don't believe that the things are written down, this is a huge deviation, but it's not kufr. This is a bid'ah, we call it, but it's not kufr. And so we say anybody who believes that there's no qadr, he denies qadr, we say this person is one of the 72 groups. This theology is not our theology. He's still a Muslim, but he's got some strange beliefs. Beliefs that are not fully in accordance. So, what makes an iftiraq a fundamental difference of theology? Not a trivial difference of theology. That's another point I want to make here. We said legal differences never should reach iftiraq. Is that clear? Legal differences that are traditional and classical, by the way, I have to make a clarification here. Modern interpretations that are completely against what our classical scholars said, now that's something else. We have somebody in America, astaghfirullah if you haven't heard of this, but you should be aware, he is performing marriages between same-sex people. <laughs> Imam, quote unquote, Sheikh. Now here we say, I don't care what, you know, the, if this is legal or theological, you have rejected what our ummah has agreed upon. And this is a heresy and deviation. You have rejected what the ummah has agreed upon. So not every legal difference of opinion, but I'm saying, what was my rule of thumb? The classical differences within the madhahib that have been accepted. And for your level, Hanafi, Shafi'i, Maliki, Hanbali, these are the four, historically there are more, the advanced students know this, but for our level, at this level, the four madhahib. The differences between them, 
should never reach the level of iftirak. Separating masajid, not praying behind people, not at all. And anybody who does this with all respect to them, they are not knowledgeable of Islam. They're acting in a manner that is overzealous and ignorant. But a, a change of theology of a major nature, now a change of theology of a minor nature, does not necessarily break away from the ummah. And I want to be very blunt and controversial here. After all, what's my middle name? Exactly, Mr. Controversial. I want to give an example here. I gave an example yesterday. And I'll give a similar example today. The issue of celebrating the birthday of the Prophet ﷺ. Again, a very heated debate takes place. And again, you have ardent champions on this side and ardent deniers and naysayers on the other. And it is my humble position and opinion that this difference of opinion should not lead to iftiraq, even if there is ikhtilaf. Let me repeat, that's what the truth I'm using these Arabic on purpose, by the way. And you can learn these two words of Arabic. This is an ikhtilaf. It is a difference. And it is a difference that needs to be discussed, needs to be debated by the academics, needs to have a discussion and let the people who are interested come in and be interested. But it should not lead to iftiraq. We should agree to disagree in a manner without blaming the other party. I have a position and I respect the other position even if I respectfully disagree with it. You understand my point here? I believe my position is right, as Imam Shafi'i said. I believe my position is right. But I allow the possibility that the other group, inshallah, their sincerity, Allah will reward them. They're coming together out of love of the Prophet ﷺ. I might disagree in how they express that love. But can anybody say these people, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. Anybody will say they're not Muslim because they're practicing the mawlud. Will anybody say they're kafir, astaghfirullah for doing this? Think about this. No, of course not. I might say this is not the best way to express love. This is my position. But I acknowledge what is the niyyah that they have in their hearts. Why are they doing what they're doing? Out of love for the Prophet ﷺ. And that love is something I have been commanded to have as well. So I look at the basis and I say, okay, this is an ikhtilaf. And let us discuss, let us debate. You bring your evidence, I bring my evidence. Let our students of knowledge come together and listen to their mashayikh. But at the end of the day, let us shake our hands and hug one another and realize what combines us is love and hub of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Isn't that the case? Right? So let us agree that the basis of this disagreement is in fact no disagreement. And that is loving the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Look at the positives, and I'm not saying, I repeat what I said yesterday, don't ignore the negatives, don't ignore these differences, but don't ignore the positives as well. Don't ignore the negatives as well. So, not every ikhtilaf should lead to iftiraq. Not every difference of opinion leads to a division. Now, another uh, point that we're coming here, another point that we come to here, is that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa remarked that there is one saved group. And obviously the question on everybody's mind is, which group is that? And the response is very simple. Depends on who you ask. <laughs> because every single group, I mean, do you know any group that says, oh, we're part of the 72, you, you guys are the 73rd. Do you know any group like that? Oh, we are the Dalin and you are the Sirat al Mustaqim. Do you know any group? I don't know any group like that, right? So the reality is, I cannot tell you what is the saved group because you have to answer to Allah on the Day of Judgment about yourself and not me. You have to answer about yourself in front of Allah. And you cannot say, oh, a Shaykh said and that's why. Correct? You have to use what Allah has given you of your knowledge, of your intellect, of your sincerity. And you make that decision. And we have certain generic guidelines from our Prophet wasallam. And of those guidelines are mentioned in Tirmidhi and Abu Dawud and others. He said in one of the hadith, Al-Jama'ah. And Al-Jama'ah translates as the group. And one of the main meanings of Al-Jama'ah and the primary meaning of the word, to be honest, the primary meaning 
it means the masses, the bulk. The bulk, al-jama'ah. And this shows us one of the blessings Allah has given us. And that is, and He has given this to our Prophet and that is, the bulk of His ummah shall be generically rightly guided. The bulk of the ummah shall be those who are al-jama'ah. And historically speaking, look at the, the, the bulk of the Muslims. Look at what combines them. Love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, respect of the messenger, following the sunnah of the Prophet loving the sahaba, believing in the six pillars of iman. Isn't this the case? That the bulk of the Muslims around the world, they have the same simple generic beliefs that all of us in this room have. We can ask even a child, what are the six pillars of iman? We can ask this child in China, we can ask a child in America, we can ask a child in Trinidad. And they will say, the six pillars of Iman, belief in Allah and His messengers and the Malaik and the Kutub and the Rusul, and Yawm Al-Akhir and Khadr Khairi wa Sharri. We can ask generic questions that should we follow, who should we follow? Who is our role model according to Islam? And they will say our role model is the Prophet So if you ask basic questions of theology, guess what? The bulk of the ummah is on the same theology. And this leads us to another point. We judge a person not based upon the group his father gave him, but based upon his own self. We don't care if he prays in this masjid or that masjid. Wallahi, we do not care. We do not care if the imam of the masjid has a belief we disagree with. The average Muslim on the face of this earth believes in a generic belief that we have as well. And this is something every one of you knows from your own experiences and reality. No Muslim is born with a label across his face, that's only Dajjal. Don't bring it into the Muslims. Dajjal will be born with a label. You know this. What label would Dajjal have? Kafir. He's the one Kafir, he's written there. Alhamdulillah, nobody else is born like that. No Muslim has a label. So suppose his family is from group X, his imam is from group Y. It is not correct for you just because he goes to the group X masjid, prays behind the group Y imam. Yaqi, this is how his father taught him Islam. This is the shaykh he knows as a child. Okay, but generically, he is not aware of the details of that theology. He doesn't know that the shaykh might believe X, Y, Z. He's just going to pray Jumu'ah, where his father taught him to pray Jumu'ah. You understand my point here? So for you to label him as, oh, he's all X. This is a big mistake. Because if you were to ask him, as I said, generic questions, simple questions about Islam, about love of the Prophet about uh, the, even for example, one of the simple things that combines most Muslims of the world, which books do you study if you want to study Islam? You will study Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, you will study the Quran, the Tafsir of Jalalain, Tafsir of Ibn Kathir. These are the standard books across all curriculums of the Sunni world. And this is the reality. So for us to now create divisions when they do not actually exist, this is a problem. We're reading in divisions where they don't actually exist. So what did our Prophet say? al jamaa Another thing he said, what I am following today are my companions. And this shows us, and this is another very controversial issue, but I will say it. Yes, respect of the companions is fundamental to our religion. Because our process has made it fundamental. Because Allah makes it fundamental. Radiallahu anhum wa radu'an, it occurs half a dozen times in the Quran. Allah is pleased with them, they are pleased with Him. So anybody who does not respect the companions, we say to this person that this is a belief that causes deviation. This is a belief that is not within the correct beliefs. They might still be within the 73, we're not kicking them out of Islam. We're not kicking them out of Islam, but this is a deviation. And this deviation must be corrected. But we get to the next point here now, that suppose a person of these 72, the, 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 the wrong, the, the misguided ones, dies in that state. What does this mean? Many people will assume automatically, oh, he's Jahannam, khalas. Because our Prophet said, the 72 are going to Jahannam except for one. 
We're talking about, by the way, somebody who genuinely has a theological issue. He denies Qadr, or he doesn't respect the Sahaba, that type of person. We're not talking about generic Sunnis. Generic Sunnis are Sunnis. Generic Sunnis, and by Sunni, what do I mean, by the way? I mean those who worship Allah alone, who believe in the finality of the Prophet ﷺ, who respect the Sahaba. This is really in essence what the Sunni is. Respect of the Sahaba is what was the defining characteristic of Sunni Islam. All the other groups that formed, they didn't respect the Sahaba. The Khawarij and the other non-Sunni groups. You know which groups I'm referencing here. The, these groups did not respect the Sahaba. The groups that respected the Sahaba, they're generically called Sunni groups. Now, there are fine differences within the Sunni groups. And this is a reality we all know. But these differences are fine. These differences are trivial compared to the differences with the other groups. And a lot of times these differences are created by us. His father happened to be a member of this jamaat. His father happened to be a member of that masjid. His family is known to support that cause. So we label him, oh that guy's that, that guy's that. But in reality, this guy is praying five times a day and this guy is praying five times a day. In reality, this guy is fasting Ramadan, this guy is fasting Ramadan. In reality, this guy is facing Makkah, this guy is facing Makkah. In reality, he's reading Quran, he's reading Quran. So we are creating these divisions, frankly, much of which are imaginary. And even if some are real, and I gave you the example of the Mawlud or whatnot, okay, I disagree and I might not do it. But in the end of the day, this ikhtilaf should not lead to... Iftiraq. I hope you memorize this phrase now. This ikhtilaf should not lead to iftiraq. Now, suppose as we said, somebody dies with a wrong theology. Somebody who is not respectful of the Sahaba. A group, is a, the second largest group, does not generally respect the Sahaba. We say this is a problem. It's definitely a problem. We're not going to ignore it. We're not going to shove it under the rug. It's a problem. What does this mean? It means... That this belief is a belief that could potentially be punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the Day of Judgment. But, two things. Number one, even if this person is punished, he's still a Muslim. Which means eventually what? Will enter Jannah. Because we already verified that the 73 groups are all from the Ummah. We already verified this. So, we believe, and this is well known, and this is proven in the Quran and Sunnah, that eventually, every Muslim, man qala la ilaha illallah dakhal al-jannah, whoever says la ilaha illallah, and he, yani the conditions are met of la ilaha illallah, meaning he acts upon it, he believes in it, and generically, all of these 73 groups believe in la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. We already said, anybody who worships another god, the nation of Islam says God comes down on earth, and they worship this man. I'm sorry, that's not a Muslim. Anybody who denies the finality of the Prophet this is, we're not talking about them. They don't, they're not in the equation. But whoever says, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, and they believe in this, the way that it should be believed, and they act upon it the way, basically, based salah and zakah and hajj and Ramadan, what not, and this is the bulk of the ummah. Even if they have deviation, bid'ah, they will be punished if Allah wants them to be punished for a period of time and then eventually they will go to Jannah. So you can hate them as much as you want in this world, you have to be with them eternally in the next. <laughs> Think about that. The second point, the second point about this sub-point, I, I should say this is a sub-point of this one. We said it is possible Allah might punish them. Notice I said, it is possible that Allah might punish them. Look at the disclaimers here. Why? Because, my dear brothers and sisters, we believe very clearly from the Quran and Sunnah. And again, the evidences for this are beyond the scope of this talk. So for now, you're just going to have to... Trust me, what I'm saying is not controversial. All theologians uh, agree to this. That any punishment mentioned in the Quran... Allah has the right to forgive anybody whom He wants. We all know this, don't we? يَغْفِرُ لِمَنْ يَشَاءُ Allah can forgive whoever He wants. A man drinks and he dies while he was in the state of, he has whiskey in his home and he still dies and he hasn't repented. Don't we say, oh Allah, 
And suppose he was a righteous man in other matters. And by the way, it is not inconceivable. Wallahi, I know of so many people in America, they are addicted to wine. They're addicted to khamr, but they're guilty for it. And they give so much to the masjid. And I know a brother that, yani, subhanAllah, may Allah guide him and, 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 and all of us, that he does unfortunately drink, but he feels very guilty. And Allah has blessed him with a lot of wealth. And believe it or not, every Ramadan he goes for to do Umrah. Every Ramadan he goes to do Umrah. Now, we can laugh at this, and there is a comedy element involved as well, right? But what does that show? There is some iman somewhere, correct? There is some iman. He doesn't have to go Umrah and leave his job. He's a multi-millionaire, whatnot, and he has the luxury to do anything, right? He could go to the Bahamas. He could go to Trinidad, mashallah, tabarakallah. <laughs> and enjoy himself. There's a lot of enjoyment here as well, mashallah. But he decides every year to go for Umrah. Now, what does that show? Perhaps, Allah knows, perhaps on the Day of Judgment, Allah will look at the evil that he's done, and look at the good he's built, masajid, he's gone for Umrah, he's done this and that, and say, because of the good I shall forgive the evil. Don't we believe this, that Allah Azza wa will forgive people for their sins if they have good deeds? So, my dear brothers and sisters, a deviation is like a sin. A deviation is like a sin. Take it as a type of sin, because it is a type of sin. To curse the Sahaba is a sin. To deny Qadr is a sin. These are not, these are not, these are, you, you incur Allah's wrath. But every sin is judged on an individual basis, individual merit. And Allah will take into account many things. Of them, number one, how much knowledge did this person have? What if this person was totally ignorant of the Quran? And he just read it in Arabic and not understood it. And his father taught him that Islam teaches us to curse the Sahaba. Just suppose, I'm just giving an example. And this was his version of Islam. And his whole life he grew up and he died thinking this is what Islam is about. And he is praying five times a day. He is fasting Ramadan. He goes for his Hajj. He avoids the major sins. And he's ignorant of what he's doing. Allah might forgive an ignorant person. What if he has this deviation, but I gave an example of he has a lot of good deeds as well. Shaykh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, a very famous scholar, and somebody who was very clear cut about what is right and wrong. And theology, he's a theologian. Ibn Taymiyyah said that it is possible that a person of deviation, Ahl al-Bid'ah, he said, a person of deviation will occupy a higher rank than a Sunni Muslim. A person of the Sunnah, because the Sunni Muslim didn't have that many good deeds, and the person of deviation had more good deeds, and Allah forgave him for a wisdom known to him. So you realize, my dear brothers and sisters, that even if somebody has a deviation, the judge will always remain who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِنَّمَا عَلَيْكَ الْبَلَاغُ وَعَلَيْنَا الْحِسَابُ we, your job is to convey, Allah's job is to judge. We tell the whole Muslim world that anybody who curses the Sahaba has done a major sin. Anybody who disrespects Abu Bakr and Umar and Aisha, we fear Allah's curse upon them. We say this unabashedly. And we say this very clearly. At the same time, we cannot say when we meet somebody on the street, and he happens to believe in that type of theology. You are somebody Allah has cursed. How do I know that? How do I know that? Am I the judge? No. Let us always remember the very powerful hadith in Sahih Muslim. That the Prophet ﷺ said, there was a righteous man in Bani Israel, the Israelites. And he was a good salih, rajul, righteous man. And he would pass by his neighbor who was a drunkard. And he would always remind him, fear Allah, give up drinking. And the drunkard would always just ignore him. One day, the drunkard in a state of drunkenness, he got angry at this righteous man. After, can you imagine, after months and years of this, he said, who do you think you are? Has Allah appointed you to be my guardian and boss? The drunkard said to the righteous man, who do you think you are to preach to me? 
Are you my guardian? Are you the guy in charge of me? Are you my boss? Now, the drunkard fell into two sins. The first sin is drinking. And the second is sin is being rude to somebody who's giving him good advice. Okay, what happened? The righteous man became arrogant. And he said, Wallahi, I swear by Allah, Allah will never forgive you. And arrogance filled his heart. He thought himself better than this man. And arrogance is a far, far bigger sin than drinking alcohol and being rude. And Allah said, this is what the Prophet said, Allah said, and who do you think you are to speak in my name? And to swear by me that I shall never forgive him. Rather, this is in the hadith, rather I have obliterated your righteousness because of your arrogance. And this one, his repentance will be accepted. Meaning he will repent later on and he will enter Jannah. What does this show us, my dear brothers and sisters? Wallahi, my dear brothers and sisters, many of us, we feel this way about Muslims of different groups, different ideologies, different theologies. We feel we are superior to them in our persons. And we should never feel this. Rather, let me be very frank here, we should feel our theology is better than that theology, but maybe I'm not better than him. You see the difference between the two, right? I say unabashedly, that respect of the Sahaba, giving one example, you understand what I mean? there are many other examples. Respect of the Sahaba is something that is absolutely a part of our faith and tradition and religion. And anybody who disagrees, I fear generically for such a person. But suppose I meet somebody who actually believes that the Sahaba are misguided. I can never feel that I am superior to him, person to person, in the eyes of Allah. I don't know. Maybe I have a sin, maybe I have arrogance, maybe I have something else. So we have to be very clear the difference between speaking generically about theology and specifically about the person who follows the theology. The theology might be better, but I do not know who I am and my sins and that person and his sins and his righteousness. And we never, ever, ever feel that we are better than any other person. And to do so is the definition of arrogance as said by our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the point is brothers and sisters and again much can be said but uh, time is of the essence. The point is here that this hadith of the 73 groups it is an authentic hadith. It is a hadith that has much profound wisdom and benefit but it is not a hadith that is intended to cause division. Rather quite the contrary there's a lot of positive elements in the hadith. And then if we only understood the hadith properly, then we would understand that our Prophet ﷺ is predicting positive things, not negative things. He is saying the bulk of the ummah shall remain rightly guided, and the bulk of the ummah has remained rightly guided. More than 85 to 90 percent of the ummah respects the Sahaba. Generically, they are Sunni. And inshallah, they are the rightly guided group. Generically, they follow the beliefs of Islam. Within the Sunni movements, if there are specific changes and whatnot, there are, as I said, the average person following these groups, he doesn't know the reality. And he's believing in Allah and His Messenger. Also, those who disagree with us, there are other traditions. They might not respect the Sahaba, they might deny Qadr. Even them we say, look, we disagree with you. And perhaps our disagreements are such that we should have separate masajid. And I firmly believe, by the way, that anybody who curses the Sahaba, I'm speaking for myself, I will never pray behind such a person. This is my, but my praying behind him doesn't mean I say he's a kafir. It means I just, I could not concentrate knowing this is a person who curses the Sahaba. This is me. I could not concentrate. My salah will go yani, <laughs> haywire. And I don't see the point. Historically, those groups have had different masajid. Okay, fine. But they're still generically within the ummah. And Allah will judge each and every one of them on an individual level, not on the group level. And those individuals might have excuses, they might have good deeds, and they might indeed be punished. And as for us, my dear brothers and sisters, those who believe in the six pillars of Iman, those who generically believe La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, we respect the Sahaba. 
As for us, Alhamdulillah, we firmly believe that our theology is correct. But let us also realize that arrogance is one of the worst sins in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And let us realize that just because I have a good theology doesn't make me a good Muslim. Theology is one aspect of Islam. And there are many other aspects of Islam. Theology is one element. How about Salah, Khushu'ah, Quran, Tahajjud, Ibadah? How about Akhlaq, Manners? Our Prophet ﷺ said, Ad-Deenu Al-Mu'amala. The entire religion centers around how you deal with other people. Our Prophet ﷺ said, that should I not tell you about the one whom Jahannam has been made haram for, this person will not enter Jahannam, the one who's soft-spoken, soft-hearted, kind and gentle. How about that? So what if a soft-spoken, soft-hearted, kind and gentle person has a wrong belief? What's gonna happen then? In all likelihood, if he was a righteous Muslim in other aspects, Allah is Ghafoor, Allah is Rahim, Allah is Rahman, Allah is Wadud. My dear brothers and sisters, Wallahi, if one of us were to be put on the gates of Jannah, 90% of humanity would be turned away. We thank Allah, Allah is the judge. We thank Allah, Allah is the judge. And one of the famous scholars of the past, Sufyan al he said that I am happier that Allah, I would rather that Allah judge me than even my own mother. And I'm happier that Allah is the judge than even my own mother. And this is the reality. So my dear brothers and sisters, I conclude by reminding myself and all of you that Alhamdulillah, this ummah is a blessed ummah. It is an ummah, as our Prophet said, is ummah marhuma. It is a blessed ummah, an ummah of mercy. It is an ummah that has been blessed by Allah with the greatest blessings any ummah has been given. And that is to be a member of the Prophet Muhammad's ummah. This is a blessing that no other nation has been given. And we are of his ummah. So let us thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are of that ummah. Let us understand that indeed ikhtilaf does occur, but ikhtilaf does not lead to iftiraq. Let us realize that even these differences that exist, these differences insha'Allah still remain within the fold of the ummah. And let us make our hearts big enough to accept differences of opinion. We don't have to all, unity does not mean uniformity. It's a very simple statement here. Unity does not mean uniformity. Unity does not mean you have to pray exactly like I pray. And you have to say Ameen or don't say Ameen like I do. Or you have to do this or do that. No. Unity does not mean uniformity. Unity means your hearts are united under Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah says in the Quran, Inna هَذِهِ أُمَّتُكُمْ أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا وَأَنَا رَبُّكُمْ فَعْبُدُونَ This is your ummah, it is one ummah, and I am your Lord, so worship me alone. So brothers and sisters, let us try to come together to resolve these differences. Let us try to come together to overcome these problems and tensions that exist. And this is my last speech in Trinidad for the time being, inshaAllah ta'ala. Allah knows when I'm going to uh, come again. So let me conclude this speech by having absorbed three and a half days of Trini slang to try to, I hope you guys don't laugh, to try to talk a little bit like your accent that I find to be so cool. MashaAllah, tabarakallah. All ye Muslims, <laughs> listen and listen well. I have something to tell ya. <laughs> Hear this. It's a serious thing. It's a serious, serious thing. Man, all ye Muslims, you need to learn to lime together. <laughs> Insha'Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.